Folks, there's a war going on out there. And it's a war for your soul. If you won't believe this, will you believe this? What can I tempt you with to destroy you? Do you have an I want that you won't give to God and let him give it back to you? Think about that. Is there something you want that God's saying no and you want it? Irregardless of the consequences. Today we're going to take up Paul's journey to Jerusalem. And I have a couple of questions I'm going to ask. And we'll look at that. Turn to Acts 20, starting with verse 16. <clears throat> Paul is sailing around the Mediterranean and he's going from one city to another and he's preaching the gospel and preaching the word and, and, uh, to the Gentiles and the Jews. And when you know it'd be the religious Jews who gave him the most problems, the most headaches, because they had their tradition. This is the way we've been doing it all these years, and we're not changing. And everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and yet they couldn't see it. Even Paul did a wonderful job of collecting those Jewish converts to Christianity and putting them up for, to be killed. Did a great job because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he went about doing what he thought was right before God. And then God got his attention on the road to Damascus and changed his entire life in this direction. So, in Acts 20, 16, we pick up that Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus in order that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message, people. That's it, bottom line. And now, behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way, bound in spirit, bound by the spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Let's just take a, a real quick blip right here. He had been responsible for Christians being put to death. How could he dare say that he's not responsible for the blood of all men unless he had received forgiveness through the blood of Christ and repented and now is going about to restore and to bring about the revelation of the gospel to give you a little hope today that we can get past our sin and walk in righteousness before a holy God. So if Paul can receive forgiveness for what time are they accused of murder? I mean, all these people. And God said, you are a chosen vessel of mine. I say to you today, God says to you, you are a chosen vessel. And you're a royal priesthood. You are my workmanship created in my son and the good works for him. I have ordained those good works that you should walk in them. That's Ephesians 2.10. Anybody who wants to grab a hold of that. Because that's God's plan for you and for me. So he's innocent of our blood. <clears throat> for I do not shrink back from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Then he said this, be on guard 
for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. How many times he said twice to be on the alert, be on guard. All right, Paul then sails in verse chapter 21 to Miletus. And in verse 4, it says, after looking up the disciples there, we stayed there seven days. And look at the next verse. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit, that's capital S, the Holy Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to take this opportunity to inject this little thought. I want you to think about it. Do you know God could tell you something to do that everybody that knows you or anything about you would say, that's not God, don't do it? Okay? <laughs> I mean, really, think about it. How are you going to find your uniqueness? You're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Does he stamp you out the same print like they make automobiles? The same mold, the same really? No, he has given you individuality and fearfully and wonderfully made that you're part of a puzzle of God's tapestry of his grace to this world. And we're to be linked together by the power of the Holy Spirit operating in our gifting. And it's not just a puzzle made with male pieces. Men. I'm headed somewhere. I have an agenda. A word from the Lord. Keep reading verse 8. Verse 8 says, <clears throat> And on the next day we departed, don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now, Philip the Evangelist, we do realize back in Acts chapter 6, that the apostles were just so busy with the word, they didn't have time to wait on tables. So they said, let's get together some deacons, men of good report, reputation of being a servant in the house of the Lord and we will lay hands on them and confer that authority so that we can be about discerning the scriptures, praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit and ministering the word of God so that lost souls can come to the light of God's gospel and be saved. That's a pretty interesting crowd back there of seven. Stephen was one of the seven. Read where Stephen gave testimony to the Jews to the point they couldn't stand him and they rushed on him and killed him. He was a martyr for his faith and what he believed. I submit to you this morning that he was fully persuaded. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Somewhere you have to drive the nail in your life and say, I'll not compromise. This is what I'm standing on, period. Live or die. Amen. I mean, this is what the Bible's saying to the world today. The old rugged cross is being held up. Saying, judge yourself to the cross. To the world, it is foolishness. To you and me, it's eternal life. And not only eternal life in heaven one day, but thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to be possessors of the land and we are to take the authority given by God to us as believers to bring his dominion, bring about his will in the earth. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're small parts of a very important puzzle. I have a poem I wish I would thought to find it and bring it, but it's about a little puzzle piece 
And uh, I kind of wrote it about myself because I, I kind of didn't fit anywhere. Anybody feel like you just haven't fitted or fit? Fitted, fit, oh well, sorry. And uh, because you're peculiar, you're different, you're just not in the mold, don't, don't put yourself down for that because that may, that's your uniqueness. That's a divine expression of God's love through you. Think about all those snowflakes. We were talking about this earlier this morning. All those snowflakes. And not one of them is the same as another one. And uh, then I was talking about the lightning bug. Just how neat it was that God made bugs and he said, one, I think I'm going to just light one up. Bing! So you go out at night, there's a lightning bug. I mean, can you? Oh, evolution. That primordial soup. Please, give me a break. Where did it come from? Everything as we know it had to have a beginning. You know, so where did the primordial soup? You know, God. You know, I'm not going to get real deep. God said, light be, and all that stuff. I'm not going there this morning. But Philip was an evangelist. He's the one that talked to the eunuch. And I, wow, where did Ethiopia, where did all that, where did God send the word through that? You did back to Africa. I mean, pretty, pretty interesting. We don't know what the other five deacons did. It's not recorded here. I looked up and couldn't find anything. But then, uh, I'm going to read verse 8. I'm just going to keep right on going and show you something here. And on the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip and Evangelist, who was one of the seven. We stayed with him. And as we were staying, therefore, for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Oops, I skipped a verse. Who's following in your Bible and saw that I skipped a verse? Raise your hand. All right. Now, didn't it sound really good when I read it right straight through? Everything was the continuity. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit interrupted himself with a fact. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Let's just think about that for a second. Why in the world would that be mentioned here when we're talking about Paul and his journey and everything else? It was a fact that the Holy Spirit wanted to present to you and me today. Number one, that he had four virgin daughters. And number two, they were prophetesses. They spoke by the Holy Spirit of God. Now ladies, there are no limits to the authority that God will give you to operate in the gift that he's called you to walk in. There's two things. You're going to have to die to find out what it is to your will. Okay? You're going to have to die to your plans. Because God has a plan for your life. And men, I'm saying that to you too. And also I'm saying, girls, keep yourself pure for your wedding day. Men, keep yourself pure for your wedding day. I can't encourage you enough to the garbage that many counselors deal with because of premarital sex and all the things that come along with that. And as Paul said, from murder he could be Forgiven of that, when we miss God and we're tempted and our flesh leads us down a path that we shouldn't go, and we know we shouldn't, and yet we do, there is forgiveness and there is restoration for that. I want to give that message of hope, but I also want to say if you want to hear from God and be directed by God, you've got to be holy. Holiness, you've got to walk holy and circumspectly before the Lord. Is there any limitation to what God will do for you? No. You, then, God. Is he going to do some great and wonderful thing? He may. He may not. He may do something very nice like, uh, you know, grow up, raise children in the fear and admonition of the Lord and help with ministries and share the gospel with other people and not compromise the word and just be a light. Then again, he could send you to Africa, China, to some other place. Missionaries out there like Mariana in New York, streets of New York. 
So the girl comes to stay with us. Out of the blue, her whole life changed because she found about the forgiveness that's in Christ Jesus. And she was so happy about that, she wanted to go and give her life to the poor and the downtrodden. Just to give them a clean pair of socks, a meal, and tell them that Jesus loves them. Well, if you look at verse 10, and as we were staying there for some days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he had heard this, we as well as we. Now, now you realize Luke is writing, we believe Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke is writing this and says, And we... And when we heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, he fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. To be fully persuaded, you have to go to Gethsemane and give it up. Not my will, but your will. Not my will, Lord, your will. How in the world can he ever move you where... He wants you to go if you've got both your hands holding on to that steering wheel of your life. It's all right to sit behind the steering wheel, but don't put your hands on it. It's like these new cars now. You can just sit there and push a button, and it'll park itself. I don't have that much trust. don't know that I'll ever buy an automobile that will do that. I know how to parallel park. I'm very good at parallel parking, actually. So, I mean, I can go up and back in and come right in and be right there most of the time. Not even have to pull back forward unless I just want to balance out so the people behind me can get. But there, I'm in control. You see, Jesus went to the garden. He was here to die. That was his purpose on earth was to die. So he went to the garden to do what? Give you and me an example. Not my will, but your will, Father. So then he goes to the cross. How do you come to God? You go to the cross. And you receive salvation through the sacrifice that he made. That's Jesus, my Savior. But then to come to the place where you say, Jesus, be my Lord. Lord of oh Lord. Glory, hallelujah, King of kings and Lord. Okay. So, in the garden, you go from the cross back to the garden, and in the garden you say, not my will, but your will be done. Paul had been told by the Holy Spirit that he was going to Jerusalem to bear witness of Christ to the Jews in Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> verse 17, Paul arrives in Jerusalem. By verse 27, Paul is seized in the temple of that same chapter. It really makes a great read if you want to take Acts 20 through 27 or 28. Just follow Paul and what was said and how they dealt with things and getting on the ship and traveling here and what was said and whatever. And um, what happened there was a result of Paul's obedience. Now in Acts 22, we see the adventure of Paul. Because if you'll turn there, Acts 22, my Bible says Paul's defense before the Jews. Now I think this is really neat. Remember in the Old Testament where Moses was taken up out of the basket and lived in Pharaoh's house all those years, was trained in the way, and then Moses came out and lived the 
Jews back into the wilderness and separated them out of Pharaoh's house. That was kind of neat. The devil fed Moses, clothed Moses, took care of Moses, taught him the traditions of the Egyptian world, but yet in his heart of hearts, he knew something was different. And that was because he was a Jew in his heart of hearts. And then his destiny came and he submitted to God and he became the deliverer of Israel. Not in his power, in God's power and in God's timing. Well, here we have Paul, the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him. Simple, plain and simple, let's kill the man. It's kind of like if you can't kill the message, kill the messenger. Kill the messenger will stop the message. Well, what happens in 22 is that Paul is able to give testimony under the protection of the Roman guard there to give them truth about what happened to him on the road to Damascus. And he gives them testimony of what Jesus had done and who he is to them. They did not like that. <clears throat> and on verse 21 it says, and he said to them, go. God said to Paul, says, go and I will send you far away to the Gentiles. He's talking to Jews now. The last thing they want to hear is that God is going after Gentiles. Because they're his chosen people. Remember Naaman, the Syrian, healed with leprosy? Remember that in the Old Testament? Elijah, go dip in the river Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. He was a Gentile. Man, when Jesus told them that, they wanted to kill him then, right then and there. So we're not going there, but Paul was not out to win a popularity contest. And I want to share with you today, if you have fear of man, or you want to be popular, and compromise God's truth in your life, then you're going to be miserable if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it won't bother you. But if you've invited Christ into your heart and He's the one living inside of you to lead you in the way that you should go, then the enemy wants you to compromise and you will not be comfortable. So when it comes to being with friends, and circumstances arise that challenge your faith, are you going to be fully persuaded to take a stand and say, you know, I don't believe that worldview. I believe God said his son that he died on the cross for me. That won't be popular. But you know, it will separate you from the crowd. You will be in a different mode in a different direction. But guess what? Who knows who will come out of that crowd and begin to follow you as you follow Christ if you take a stand. If you compromise, sometimes the devil will just come do something right in front of you and challenge you to correct it. Now, I don't say beat people over the head with the word, but in love you can tell the truth and bring correction. See, I don't agree with that. So, what we find there is that uh, he's gone before the chief, uh, the council of the Jews, and then in Acts 23, he's gone before the chief priest and the council. And then in Acts 23, this is what comes out of obedience, people. If you obey, then God's gonna have a power to direct your path. And things that you think are accidents will be divine appointments in the direction that he's got your life. So, in, in that Paul ends up appearing and in verse 11 of 23, if you look at that, it says, The very night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause in, at Jerusalem, test, will you obey me and go to Jerusalem, even though the Holy Spirit's letting you know what's going to happen to you in Jerusalem? Obey me, says the Lord, and I will watch over you and I'll protect you. Okay? Then right here, Jesus appears and says to him, so you must witness at Rome also. I mean, the divine Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Father God, standing before Paul, says you must go to Jerusalem. 
Why? Because he wants you to bear witness to the church in Rome. To my believers there of me. So, if you keep reading, he ends up going before Felix. Um, there's a plot to kill him, and Felix is listening to his testimony. And, and look, look, God told him that, and he was with Felix and in prison, fed, allowed visitors, writing <coughs> epistles, for two years fed by the system, doing that. And then Felix had him for two years, and then Festus comes along, chapter 25, and then in that chapter, Paul says, he says, you want me to try you in Jerusalem to try you? And he says, no, I appeal to Rome, to Caesar. Why do you think he appealed to Caesar? Because years before the Holy Spirit had said, I need for you to go and be my witness in Rome. Well, of course, in Acts 26, turn there and we'll close. Paul's defense before King Agrippa. This message is about being fully persuaded. There's compromise everywhere. There's negotiation. The world does not know how to function without give and take. I just want you to know there's no give and take with God. There's, there's no compromise with God. It's either all or nothing. I just, I just want us to understand that this morning. It's either all or nothing with you. And bottom line is, do we trust him to be the Lord of our life and direct our path? This, this is a process, okay? Understand that. <clears throat> In verse 27 of Acts 26, it says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. This is the almost persuaded witness. Are you fully persuaded or almost persuaded? And Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. And the king arose, and the governor, and Bernice, that was his wife, and those who were sitting with him, and when they had drawn aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. He sealed his fate by obeying God. Age in 67 AD, historically recorded, Paul was beheaded in Rome by Nero. That, that's historical. But he lived for 10 years under house arrest, supplied the needs of life, and wrote a lot of the epistles and had people coming and visiting him right up until the time that he was executed because he appealed. He was promoted through that execution. You understand that? But Paul, like Stephen, just think about that. Here's Saul of Tarsus holding the cloaks of those stoning Stephen to death. And he sees his face because he sees the glory of God. He sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father. God opened a portal of discerning of spirits to show him the real reality. And Paul saw that. And God set him up when he went on the road to Damascus. And what did Paul do? The same thing Stephen did, except he responded to God over a life of discipleship, of discipline for the Holy Lord, the Holy Father, Father God. And because of that, you and I have the epistles to read and that we can say, 
I believe the Word of God is without error. I believe the Word of God is divinely inspired. And that makes me a square in the world. But I'd rather be a square in the world and be right before a holy God who holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave, knowing that through that blood I escape eternal separation from God and I will forever be with Him. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. Father, we just today purpose in our heart to forever settle it. And we're fully persuaded, come what may, no temptation will come our way that you have not given us a way of escape. Father, we ask to help us, help us, Holy Spirit, to be bold witnesses of your truth as revealed through the word of God and express through us divine vessels of God's mercy and grace. Father, let us give your word in love and to be good deeds in truth, worshiping you. Father, we ask that you put the lost in our path, that we might share the, your love for them, and that you would have many more souls in your kingdom because of my life, because of the lives of those here in this room today. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Sheila, if you'll come up, we're doing an invitation. Go ahead. You want, you want to say that? Oh, well, you want to add something. Okay. You're as old as you want to be. Amen. I want to be younger. I, I think younger and you know, without limits. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Well, we want to welcome our visitors and everyone else that's back. We've been gone for a while, traveling the world. And uh, we're just, I mean, we're just glad to have you home. And we're glad to be here today. And praise God. Hey, brother. Good to see you. God is good. All the time. God is good. Um, turn to Acts chapter 21, 22 in there somewhere, and I'm going to eventually get to that message. There are a couple of things I'd like to share before I do. And, um, oops, excuse me, I'm sorry. Last, uh, let's see, I made a note to myself if I can find it in here because I wanted to add something. Oh, here it is. Uh, I want to add a comment to the dream that was read here for Marie, what you, what you shared there, about things that seem right to us and pray about it because it can be a destruction, you know, be destruction. And I was just kind of, that's the one that, that uh, I think it was the second song. And we surrender to your sovereign will. I think that scripture, that dream and everything, anything that's going on in your life, that you've got plans or whatever, but, you need to take it to the cross. You need to take it to that old rugged cross. That's the benchmark of, of your future and God's plans for your life. And I couldn't help but think about the positive and the negative of the dream in the respects that there are a lot of things that we're burdened over because of us, what we've done or trying to do or want. It's not gone before the cross and it's not in God's will, and yet we're still trying to make it what we want. And we're not willing to let it go. Then there's other things on the positive side that God is working a work in you in obedience to stand and to be immovable in your faith, to be delivered into that plan and purpose God has. I call that a birthing process, and it's a it's a patience process. Remember a few weeks ago, Judy ministered on uh, the fruit of the Spirit, and um, there was uh, what, love, joy, peace, and then there was that long suffering. And in that long suffering part, that was also the, the short word for long suffering is patience. Okay, so she said, and then Terry, Brown, Terry, thank you so much for that analogy about uh, those, the first three getting on base and long suffering and patience is the cleanup batter. It's the fourth one listed, kind of brings it all home in your life. So we just thank God for 
allowing him to take us through circumstances because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is there with you right now as we speak. In the embodiment of the Holy Spirit whom the Father has sent to come and dwell in you. Now his indwelling in you presents you to the Father righteous. Covered in his blood, washed as though you never had sinned against him. Amen. That's the sin nature in our flesh. And how many remember last week I was sharing on the message about seeing into the unseen, walking by the Spirit, and not by the natural circumstances that are in your life? That doesn't make a bit of sense. That's not logical. But then I don't know a whole lot in God's Word through Revelation that is logical. It's a faith book. You believe and then you see. The world says, let me see it and I will believe it. Okay, so we, we're operating, I mean, you know, we're operating opposite of the world. Amen. You know, there are a lot of churches out there. Uh, that are preaching a compromised word. They're not preaching the true, biblical truth of the Bible. Basically, they're lying to a lot of people. You know, you know what a lie is? I think it might be the opposite of the truth. Is that a good definition? Could it be a twisting of the truth? Hmm? I, I think all of us are walking in some areas in our life. That's why we're growing up spiritually. We're walking in areas where we have a lie from the devil that we believe and it controls us because we give it power through faith, through belief. And it's there to do what? Destroy you. There has to be a benchmark. There has to be a standard. There has to be something that you're willing to nail your entire existence on. And I just think that song, Patricia, was very appropriate because the, the cross is the benchmark. God drove the principle of fraternity past and future in the cross in the ground. And then he dripped his blood through the shedding of the righteous one's blood. God's blood. That's why the virgin birth is so important. You know, there are a lot of people who don't believe the virgin birth. They still believe God. They can believe Jesus is his son. But they figure that it's had a carnal beginning and not a supernatural. And I, and I shared with you last week, part of the ministry of being led by the Holy Spirit, that you had to believe that the Word of God is infallible and without error. It's the inspired Word of God. Here. Now, my logical mind says, wait a minute, it was written by what? 60, 70 writers over a period of several hundreds of years. Well, actually, uh, thousands of years. And uh, so it was... You know how I handle that, that question in my mind? If God can create a universe, he can write a book. Amen. So we, we understand he can write a book. If there is an error in there, that's his concern. It's not mine. If he says it, then somehow I've got to wrap my mind around the fact that I'm his creation. He made me in his image and he loves me. However, I have a problem. I have a sin nature, a fallen nature. That wants to, like Paul said, why do I do the things I know that I shouldn't do and don't do the things I know that I should? Is it I that do it in name, but it is sin that dwells within the members of my body? So Paul was saying, I got a war going on inside of me. And they are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So we want to be led by the Spirit. Of course, last week I was sharing about being led by the Spirit and how the Holy Spirit will say something and, and you can either accept it or ignore it. And if you're not listening, you'll miss it. Of course, I shared the testimony of spilling a whole Coca-Cola in my truck because the Holy Spirit said, don't put that there. And it fell over and boom, a whole, I didn't have a sip out of it. And, uh, and I mean, just something really simple, but God, look, God's a practical God. He's interested in you and even the minutest thing. And he likes to know, I mean, he likes the color of shoes you ladies wear. I mean, because he'll, he'll tell you, don't wear that. You know, he told me, don't drive that car last week, and I drove it anyway, and I ended up stuck in the most busiest intersection in, right down the road here, 64 and 280. And the fuel pump died. 
Had fuel, had need, but no, no go. The fuel pump wasn't working. Well, he was, I mean, just a, I mean, here, here's what I thought. I'm going to drive the Toyota because Judy was out of town. Okay. I need to drive the Cadillac because I haven't driven in three or four days. I need to keep the juices going, keep the tires running, keep the, I mean, that's a good logical statement, wasn't it? But the Holy Spirit knew a few hours later I was going to be being pushed out of the highway. I was going to end up being taken down the road in the back of one of these vehicle haulers sitting in my Cadillac waving at everybody <laughs> like I was in a parade going to get it fixed. <clears throat> so, today, having shared that, the Bible is the heir and found the word of God with. We have to forever settle that. So when we come up in our logical mind and begin to challenge something half God said, as Satan will do, then we have to say, wait a minute, the authority is the word of God. That's the authority. I'm going to accept that. Do I understand all that? No. But I have the teacher living inside of me through the new world. And the teacher is going to reveal these things to me. The world has gone mad. They're crazy. Because they're not led by the teacher, by the Holy Spirit. They're led by the carnal mind of man. And in that is destruction of all kinds. Well, this week I'm going to share <clears throat> being fully persuaded. And I'm just going to hit a few thoughts here and we're going to have a wonderful time in the book of Acts following some things Paul has done and did and we're recording. But before I do that, I would like to promote our nice little devotional. Those of you who haven't and read it yesterday, there's some things in there that were pretty interesting and I thought I would share them with us. And then I'm going to go into something else and then we're going to get to the book of Acts. What kind of example are you? This is uh, Saturday, June 9th selection. And um, this, I'm just going to start in the middle of this. Some will depart, in the, in the end, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. There are a lot, there's a great falling away that's coming. We understand that. We know where we are biblically, you know, in the timetable. And that there are a lot of believers who are going to fall away. So this is why we're talking about being fully persuaded today, not being deceived. And um, <clears throat> he warns, stay anchored to the truth or you'll be caught in the undertow of error. Um, I cannot imagine the uh, young people in here, the amount of, I mean, even for myself, just any exposure to media and the messages, the undercurrent of the undertow of the messages that are being put out there. I mean, sex is everything in the world. Why? Because it's a very strong motivational to move one to action. And the advertisers, they know that. So everything has different connotations. Um, keyed in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Buy that car. You know, that'll make you, you know, pride of life. Look what I've got. You know, I like a convertible. Anybody like convertibles? Yeah, I like convertible. It's not practical for me. Okay? I try to talk Judy into, well, it'll mess my hair up. And then riding down the road, the sun is so hot. So, you know, I, you know, we, we need to be practical about that. But listen, <clears throat> stay anchored to the truth. Here is a fact that should alarm us. 90%. Everybody say 90%. 90%. 90%. 90%. About 90%. Okay, listen to this. Of all those who end up in cults, started out in mainline churches. It's a pretty strong statistic. Searching for something. And a lot of churches are given religion and a false religion at that. So there's so many people out here that are not here this morning because they have rejected the message of the church and what they've rejected is the wrong message. They need to know the truth because the truth will set you free. But now listen to this line of thought. 
How does this happen? Because they weren't grounded in the truth of Scripture. They are like the guy who was asked, what do you believe? Think about this. He replied, the same thing my church believes when asked. What does your church believe? He replied, same thing I believe. And when asked, what do you both believe? He replied, we both believe the same thing. Pretty neat little book, I might add. Bottom line, he didn't know what he believed. And there are a lot of people. If you test them in what they believe, what is the firm foundation of your facts? Pastor Judy brought that out Wednesday night in a teaching that she did about the basics of Bible doctrine and truth. We build on those things. Yes, there's a wonderful power of the Holy Spirit. He's moving mightily through the body. Uh, he's empowering prophets and um, you know, apostles and teachers and, you know, in, in the body today to shepherd a flock, to teach and bring forth the word. But every bit of it has to be brought back to the standard of the cross and to the word of God. Now, I got here, I have here a little uh, clipping from the opinion of the reader. I've had occasion to write my opinion in there once or twice. And uh, all of us know that uh, recently we had to vote as a state, North Carolina proposition or Amendment 1, as to whether or not same-sex couples could marry one another in our state. I was really disturbed. By the way, we're not afraid to take a stand for truth in this pulpit, through the internet, everything that we're doing, because we're not going to compromise what the Word of God says, okay? Um, so we just want to understand that. So here, here's an opinion of the reader regarding this whether or not we believe that the Bible is in the inerrant word of God. I'm not going to give, try not to give the, the sex, or I don't have the name because I cut it off. That's not what I'm here to say. This is what I want to communicate is the thought behind this. Listen. <clears throat> Through high school, I attended church multiple times on Sunday, then again on Wednesdays, Wednesday evening, and I had choir practice when I was old enough and then off to college and I did basically the same thing in college my goal was was to become a director of religious education the more I learned about the history <clears throat> excuse me the more I learned about the history of, write, of the writing of the Bible the more my goal changed instead of my bachelor's degree in religious education I chose to receive a master's degree in another helping profession. The point of my sharing this personal history is to say that the more I have learned, the more I know the Bible cannot be taken literally. Now let's just take a real wild example of this. <coughs> Was Jonah swallowed by a great fish? Yeah. Do you know Jesus affirmed that? I mean, if we believe he's the Son of God, and he said, as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. I believe that. Yes. You want to locate somebody in their Christian walk, and they are walking and saying, I'm a Christian, ask them, do you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish? And they say, no, no, that's just an allegory. No, they're drinking the Kool-Aid as the expression goes in our society today. I mean, like I, like I said, we either believe because there's a great truth in what happened to Jonah, sent as a prophet to Nineveh, and they repented and turned from their sin and were forgiven. 150 years later, Nahum went and said, you're toast, it's over. And they were destroyed <coughs> completely. Nahum, you want to read that. <coughs> And the more I have learned, the more I know the Bible cannot be taken literally. Jesus' role model in the New Testament, which to me is somewhat more believable than the Old Testament, would not condone our behavior around the issues related to Amendment 1. So what this person is doing is painting a picture of us standing for what God's Word says is the way a family should be defined as that God would not approve of us taking a stand against that, but that he would affirm that relationship. 
when it's diametrically opposed to the Word of God and the teachings of the Bible. So we're either Bible believers or not. And there's no way to compromise the two. You come up against that, you either change and conform to the Word of God as it's revealed to you from glory to glory as you submit yourself to the revelation of the truth. First order of business for the devil is to keep you from reading your Bible and believing that God will speak to you. That he will reveal that truth to you. I'm giving a little reading if there's any way you can turn it somewhere. <clears throat> the mic seems to be rather hot. Uh, I had to make it hot because you moved it down. You'll pull it back up and we'll be fine. Okay, I coughed into it and I thought, I, okay, that over there? Yeah. Well, 